So today we're exploring the history and the evolution of the wheel. The wheel belongs in a pretty short list of inventions that have stayed with humanity ever since the earliest stages of our civilization and evolved together with us. The wheel played a key part in shaping and building our world and today we'll pay tribute to this simple yet genius invention by exploring its history, all the way from its invention, through its many different forms of the past, to its present and we'll even try to make some educated guesses about its future. So let's get started on our deep dive into the history and evolution of the wheel. So when was the wheel invented? Well, that depends on how you define a wheel. If you think a wheel is a rolling log, then wheels are absolutely ancient and can be traced back to the second half of the Neolithic age, where they played a key part in the construction of megalithic or large stone buildings. Large stones or rocks would be pushed or pulled over rolling logs. Logs from the back would be brought back to the front to keep the object moving. But obviously rolling logs are far from what we consider to be a wheel. And although many of us strongly associate wheels with transportation, that which many agree upon is the first wheel didn't have anything to do with transportation. Most archaeologists and researchers agree that the first wheel was invented in Mesopotamia, in the region roughly corresponding to today's Iraq. And it had nothing to do with transportation because it was a potter's wheel. So obviously it was used to improve and speed up the process of making pottery. It took humanity approximately another 300 years to develop the first wheels to be used for transportation. And one theory suggests that they likely evolved from the rolling logs we mentioned earlier. It is likely that early humans sought ways to improve and escape the rowing log way of transporting large objects. It was inefficient, difficult and outright dangerous. Obviously moving logs around all the time was very hard and, and it required a lot of manpower. It was also difficult to keep the object on course. And this is why archaeological findings suggest that humans around many different areas of the world actually opted to use sledges instead. They used very large sledges which were pulled along evenly flattened earth. And although this did increase friction, it was a lot more predictable, less dangerous and it was easier to keep the object on course. It also eliminated the need to move large logs around constantly. The next step that significantly improved the moving of heavy objects was the combination of large switches and logs. In this case, the logs weren't rolling, instead they were fixed by being partially buried in the ground and or by using pegs. This dramatically reduced friction, but it also eliminated the need to constantly move the logs around. A popular theory suggests that what we consider to be a wheel actually evolved from this sledge and log combo. As the sledge made many passes over the logs, it wore grooves into the logs, creating something that looks like a wheel and axle combo. Archaeological findings do support this theory because the earliest wheeled vehicles actually had the axle and the wheel rotating together as one unit. Obviously this was pretty inefficient because the entire length of the axle created friction as it rotated under the vehicle. And obviously you needed a thick axle to support the weight, but also the thicker the axle the more friction it produced. Another downside was that the wheels couldn't rotate at different speeds, which meant that taking corners was often difficult. The final key step in the evolution of the primitive wheel was when the axle became fixed and the wheel rotated on the axle. This enabled the wheels to turn at different speeds, which eased taking corners, but it also reduced friction only to the part of the wheel contacting the axle. Although the wheel is considered one of the oldest human inventions and often cited together with fire as the earliest catalyst of human progress, fact is that many other inventions came before the wheel. Needles and clothing, pottery, agriculture, ships, and even musical instruments and metal casting all came before the wheel. There are two main reasons for the relative late coming of the wheel. The first one is that making resilient and actually usable wheels required precision, which meant that you needed metal tools to shape the holes and the axles so that they weren't you know, useless. This means that by the time the wheel was actually used and widespread throughout the world, most of the regions in the world were in the late copper or in the bronze age. The second reason is that there's no counterpart in nature for the wheel. Most early human inventions were made by seeing something in nature, getting inspired and then recreating something similar for our own use. For example, we made 
table forks by seeing forked sticks or branches in trees. We made clothes by stealing fur from animals. We later made airplanes by seeing birds fly. But when it comes to the wheel, there's nothing, no animal, no plant, no anything that moves in a motion similar to the rolling motion of the wheel. The only thing that sort of comes close is a tumbleweed, but even that doesn't roll, it tumbles, and obviously it has nothing that resembles axles or wheels with holes. The first wheels were just solid discs of wood. Although they did roll, they were very heavy and cumbersome and moving things around with them was pretty hard. The Greeks are credited with the first major improvement of the wheel because they developed the H-type wheel. The H-type wheel is essentially a set of rounded boards with another set of boards on top of them at a perpendicular angle creating a sort of a letter H-shape. Although Greeks did improve the wheel, it was the ancient Egyptians who first really shaped excess weight from the wheel by developing the spoke, something which in one form or another would become a critical part of all wheels from then on. The spoke appeared more than a thousand years after the first wheels used for transportation. The idea behind it is simple, use less material for the wheel, get rid of all the excess material until you're left with just enough to support the structure of the wheel and the loads applied to it. It might seem like a simple idea today, but the spoke revolutionized things because it enabled much faster and more efficient transport. Although ancient Egypt solved the issue of weight, it didn't fix the issue of wear. Now, wood is good for wheels because it's relatively lightweight, but it isn't really wear resistant. When wood continuously rolls on hard abrasive surfaces, it wears out pretty fast, which means that wheels made completely out of wood would have to be serviced or replaced pretty often. And it would take another thousand years for the issue of wear to be solved, and according to archaeological evidence, it was solved by the Celts, because the oldest archaeological findings of wooden wheels with an iron rim or band around their outside were found on Celtic chariots. By wrapping the outside edge of a wooden wheel with a durable iron band or rim, the wood was no longer exposed to the wear and tear, and a wear-resistant wheel was born. So the fixed axle fixed the issue of friction, the spoke fixed the issue of weight, and the iron bands fixed the issue of wear. So what do you think, what was the next thing that needed to be addressed on the wheel? Of course, it was comfort. A solid wooden wheel with an iron band around it is very uncomfortable because it's very ineffective at absorbing bumps, holes and other road imperfections. Interestingly enough, it will take humanity almost 3,000 years to start seriously addressing the issue of comfort. The beginning of end for discomfort came in 1847, when one Robert William Thompson submitted for a patent for air inflatable or pneumatic tires. Now, some bicycle wheels and even some other types of wheels by this time had received a layer of rubber on their outside, but this was solid, hard rubber, which was of very low well quality, it didn't last a lot, and although it did somewhat improve comfort, it was still at a level very far away from what is considered acceptable today. Although Mr. Robert William Thompson was granted the patent, he never went into production with his idea. The first pneumatic tire saw the light of day 41 years later in Belfast, Ireland in 1888. The man behind it was John Boyd Dunlop, one of the most successful veterinarians in Ireland. Dunlop's idea for a pneumatic tire came from his desire to improve the comfort of his 10-year-old son when he was riding his tricycle over rough terrain. Although born from a father's wish to help his son, the comfort advantages of the pneumatic tire were soon made obvious to everyone else, and very soon Dunlop's tires started replacing the hard rubber tires on all the bicycle wheels at that time, and thus the Dunlop Tire Company was born, a company that is to this day one of the largest tire manufacturers in the world. It's interesting to note that Dunlop's patent for tires really only concerned itself with bicycle tires, and this is because cars weren't really widespread in 1888. Credit for using pneumatic tires on cars goes to brothers André and Edouard Michelin. They also further improved upon the pneumatic tire by patenting a removable pneumatic tire in 1891, and this tire could be removed and installed without the usage of glue. But the success of both Dunlop and the Michelin brothers stands on the shoulders of Charles Goodyear. He patented the process of tire vulcanization in 1844. 
Before the advent of vulcanization, tires were pretty much useless because they had an extremely short lifespan. When they got hot, they would get sticky, debris would stick to them, and they would very quickly burst. The final step in improving the lifespan of tires and making them even more resilient came from the BF Goodrich company in 1910, when they added carbon into the rubber. But before this major ball to discomfort, another major ball to weight was made with the birth of the wire wheel, or the tension spoked wheel. Instead of relying on large solid spokes, the wire wheel relies on thin tension spokes, which function mechanically the same way as flexible tension wire would. They keep the ring true while also saving weight and resisting loads applied onto the wheel. Various patents for wire wheels were granted as early as 1802, and wire wheels graced many of the early memorable bicycle designs. There's still on many bicycles on the roads today. Also, the world's first car, the Benz Patent Motorwagen from 1885, had wire wheels. Now, its simplistic and lightweight design made it suitable for wire wheels. However, most other notable early cars that followed after the Benz Patent Motorwagen were unsuitable for wire wheels because they were heavy and or faster which made the wire wheels too weak to sustain the increased holds. Instead, most other early cars used something known as artillery wheels. And these are the kinds of wheels you would see on old cannons. They were usually large, made from heavy solid wooden spokes, often in combination with hard solid rubber tires. A major breakthrough for wire wheels came with tangentially spoked wire wheels. This dramatically increased strength and resilience as well as durability of wheels, making them finally suitable for cars. Another key factor that contributed to the spread of wire wheels onto cars was the introduction of the quickly detachable wire wheel patented by the Rudge Whitworth company in 1907. The idea for a quickly detachable wheel came from Pioneer Motors' John Pugh and son of company founder Charles Pugh. Now John realized that the only way to quickly and easily replace a punctured tire was to make the wheel quickly detachable from the car. Before his invention, tires had to be replaced with the wheel still on the car. This was often very difficult, time-consuming and outright frustrating if it had to be done on the side of the road. And thus, quickly detachable Rudge Whitworth wheels would grace many iconic cars over the years. These wheels were not only very lightweight, but their two rows of tangential spokes were very good at resisting cornering, acceleration, and braking stresses. Now, these wheels were secured onto the car using a single centerlock large winged nut, which was called a knockoff nut. Now, no, it wasn't made in China. It was called a knockoff nut because to start the unscrewing of the nut, it had to be knocked off using a special rubber mallet. Now, in the late 60s, legislation in many parts of the world forbid the usage of large winged nuts due to safety concerns. So what we got instead were large hexagonal nuts, which had to be removed using a large wrench, similar to modern center lock wheels. Now, wire wheels offer many benefits, but they were a luxury on cars due to their increased cost. And this led to the development of pressed or stamped steel wheels. Stamped steel wheels were easier, quicker, and cheaper to manufacture, which led to their usage on every car where the increased cost couldn't be justified by the importance of weight saving, making them a very common sight on more affordable cars which were produced in great numbers. The manufacture of stamped steel wheels is quick and cheap because the center section can be made with one single simple stamping motion. The outer rim can be also made from a single strip of steel which is rolled and welded together, and then simply the center section is either riveted or welded to the outer rim. This is the same process that most modern steel wheels use to this day. Now, wire wheels started disappearing from cars in the early 70s and were almost completely gone by the late 80s. However, they are used very extensively to this day on adventure, trial, and enduro motorcycles. The increased flexibility of wire wheels makes them much less susceptible to deformation when riding over rough terrain. On top of this, their ease of serviceability and repair when you're out in the field usually means that you'll be back on the road much more quickly than with a cast alloy wheel. The next big step for wheels was the usage of metal alloys, and although we often associate aluminum slash aluminium alloys uh, with alloy wheels, the reality is that most early alloy wheels were actually made from magnesium and were known as mag wheels. 
But by the late 1960s, improvements in aluminum casting technology made it possible to cast aluminum alloy wheels, which were not as brittle as their predecessors. And this favored the spread of aluminum alloy wheels, which were a much more cost-effective option than magnesium, which is a pretty expensive alloy. All the aluminum alloy wheels started to become truly widespread only by the mid-70s, their first actual usage dates all the way back to 1924, and was pioneered by French automaker Ettore Bugatti. Now, racing car designer Harry A. Miller actually had the idea to cast aluminum wheels even before that, in 1920. He even had the concept patented, but never actually made any wheels. It was Ettore Bugatti who soon afterwards, in 1924, uh, successfully cast the first usable aluminum wheel in the company's own foundry in Molsheim, using molds he designed himself. And so starting with 1924, the legendary Bugatti Type 35 race car featured cast aluminum wheels with eight flat wide spokes, an integrated brake drum and a removable rim. Aluminum alloy wheels offer numerous benefits. First of all, they're lighter than their steel counterparts, which means that they can improve handling by reducing unsprung mass. Aluminum is also good at conducting heat away, which can help with brake cooling. Another fact with alloy wheels is that they enable a more open design, which can also help to dissipate heat away from brakes. Also, they're usually more aesthetically pleasing and enable pretty much endless design possibilities. Despite this, many iconic alloy wheel designs were actually made to mimic their wire wheel predecessors. The final major improvement for the strength and weight equation of wheels came in the form of carbon fiber. Although we believe that carbon fiber wheels are something very new and exotic, the fact is that the first carbon fiber wheels appeared all the way back in 1971. The first carbon reinforced resin wheels were made by Michelin for Citroen's SM based rally car, which was a 1.5 ton wheel capable of crushing any alloy wheel of the time. But back then Michelin owned Citroen, so they leveraged their R&D department to create what back then many considered to be a plastic wheel. Despite the public's initial doubt of the performance of the plastic wheel, it ended up being half the weight of its alloy counterpart and more than capable of surviving the massive stresses of rallying and the very heavy Citroen SM rally car. The carbon resin wheeled Citroen SM debuted at the Morocco Rally in 1971 and won. And following this success, Citroen decided to offer the same wheels for owners of road going Citroen SMs. Now, Citroen ceased the production of the SM in 1975, but another OEM fiber wheel appeared in the late 80s when Carroll, Shelby, and Dodge partnered to create the CSX. The final version of this car, called the CSX VNT, hit the market in 1989 wearing a set of resin composite wheels with a very Americanized name, Fiber Rides. This was the first time that an American car company offered a car with a set of glass fiber reinforced wheels. Following this, there was a long hiatus for carbon fiber OEM wheels that lasted until 2013 when Koenigsegg started offering single piece carbon fiber wheels on their cars. In 2017, Porsche also joined the OEM Carbon Fiber Wheel Club by offering carbon fiber braided wheels for their 911 Turbo S exclusive series. Although other cars besides Porsche and Koenigsegg had carbon wheels on them, none were developed in-house, but instead made by a company called Carbon Revolution, which specializes in the development and production of carbon fiber wheels. So what about the future? Well, thanks to the advent of electricity and electric motors and their compact nature, the wheels of the future will also be the motors of the future. We can already see this technology implemented in many markets, where the hub of the wheel is also the motor for the vehicle. But if hub motors aren't futuristic enough for you, don't worry, because in the future we might be seeing more hubless wheels with hubless motors. Again, this is enabled by the compact nature of electric motors and the many possibilities with their design. What about tires? Well, tires might be de-evolving back into their past aero selves, but of course with much better performance. Michelin, Bridgestone and many other major tire brands have been working on their own version of the aero tire. And although they have been doing this for years, none of these tires have seen widespread use yet. However, there are some indicators now that they might hit the mass market around 2025. Also, we can hope that increased competition in the carbon fiber wheel market will reduce their price and we might be seeing them more often on cars as well. Despite the promise of flying cars back in the 80s, it seems that the groundbound wheel is here to stay. And it's no wonder, because its simplicity and effectiveness simply can't be beat. Because after all, nothing rolls better than a wheel. And there you have it. 
that's pretty much it when it comes to the history and evolution of the wheel. As always, thanks all for watching and I'll be seeing you soon with more fun and useful stuff on the D4H channel.